Okay, uh, in order to be uh, respectful of everyone's time, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Critical Dialogues, Virtual Reality and Advanced Manufacturing CTE. Uh, my name is Patrick Ahern with RTI, and I'll be helping out with the virtual room this afternoon. Uh, so please note when you log in, uh, your microphone and your web camera will be automatically muted. Uh, if you need to switch between your phone and computer audio, uh, you may adjust your audio settings on the Zoom toolbar. Also, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand and ask your question verbally, you may click the raise hand button. And at that point, we can grant you microphone uh, rights. Uh, also, you can use the Q&A window and type uh, your questions in the, in, into the Q&A window and submit those uh, for our panelists as well. If you happen to run into any technical issues this afternoon, uh, please let me know in the chat window, uh, or you can send an email at the email address you see at the bottom of your screen, and I can help with troubleshooting. Uh, but at this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Michael Brick Crane for some opening remarks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure again to be uh, working with Greg Henschel and the Department of Education um, to put together a series of um, programs uh, for you guys. Um, today, we've got uh, a couple of or a few great speakers uh, from Clemson University and MIT uh, who are utilizing virtual environments um, in a very practical and accessible uh, fashion in their um, in their education uh, in their digital education approaches. Um, some of you uh, may be familiar with um, some of these approaches, but uh, I think. Um, this is the, the first in our two um, events on, on this subject, and uh, this one is, is really focused on um, practical applications with um, you know, tangible results and uh, getting into a little bit of you know, what it takes um, to put these type of um, capabilities together and, and integrate them into digital courseware. Um, I know for many of you uh, are, are working on um, or will be working on soon uh, some open edX um, courses. And uh, this hopefully leads the way to um, you know some some opportunities or, or capabilities that uh, may be able to put into practice, um, not in the first iteration probably, but uh, down the line. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Greg to introduce our speakers and, and say a bit about um, our program today. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I just want to say a couple things. One is that uh, the Department of Education is investing uh, our resources into focused technical support for uh, the institutes and through, through you for the EWD mission because we recognize what a pivotal role that the institutes can play. And uh, we may want to uh, do some programs of this sort uh, for larger groups of constituents, but we always want to take uh, the best of what we have and bring it here first because of your, the important uh, role that you play as leaders. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, looked high and low for some of the best things that are going on in uh, virtual reality simulations and, and uh, extended reality various technologies and found that uh, uh, the team uh, between Clemson and MIT uh, may be doing some of the most important work, uh, somewhat complementary work, and we'll hear about that today. Uh, we're, we call this part one because we have another program uh, that we're going to be uh, sharing with you very soon, scheduling uh, with uh, uh, a statewide initiative in Alabama. But we'll save talk about that for another time. And uh, we'll start with uh, our good colleague uh, from Clemson, Anand Brahmapadhyay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you, you all hear me loud and clear? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Michael and Greg, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, um, as you mentioned, um, uh, I'll talk about uh, how we got here from a 60,000 feet view. Um, this is a wonderful partnership with MIT uh, on education and workforce development initiative. 
that brings together uh, um, the best uh, of the best uh, and adds to the capacity. Uh, and our objective throughout this enterprise has been uh, how to build a capacity um, in e-learning tools. Uh, next slide, please. Why did workforce development become important? And this slide sort of gives you, uh, these are the what are, are called the emerging mega regions of the country, uh, the fastest growing regions of the country. And you see the green area, it extends from Raleigh to Birmingham. Uh, and right in the middle is Clemson, South Carolina. Um, uh, it's one of the fastest growing regions of the country uh, where we are, uh, it has got the highest number of engineers per capita in the country. And you say, how come in South Carolina? Uh, you got um, headquarters of BMW, you got headquarters of Michelin, you got headquarters of GE energy uh, facilities, Honeywell, Lockheed Martin, F-16, you name the company, it's here. Uh, for the first time, Boeing, uh, when they decided to build the wide-bodied aircraft, um, they located the South Carolina, Charleston area. So, um, what that means is uh, there is tremendous need for advanced manufacturing workforce. Uh, and they wanted to short circuit the education process to deliver quickly that education and make it readily available um, to their workforce. And also to, to the technical, technician education community in the technical colleges. And so we partnered with DOD, we are partnering with National Science Foundation as part of this initiative. Next slide. Uh, a unique thing about Clemson has been um, its innovation campuses, and that's why workforce development became uh, important. So we have the Clemson main campus, but we have separate what we call as public-private partnerships in advanced materials, um, which is an $80 million separate campus. Uh, we have a COI car campus in Greenville, which is a, another campus focusing on automotive and advanced manufacturing, health innovation, uh, restoration institute in uh, Charleston focusing on energy, big data, and the one on um, genetics and diagnostics. What that focus has brought about is the need for close public-private partnership on workforce, education, and innovation initiatives. Next slide. And as part of this initiative, uh, Clemson worked closely to develop an industry engagement strategy. What does that mean? Uh, next slide. Uh, we came up with a unique way of talking first with industry leaders, and that slide shows the CEOs of BMW, the CEOs of Bosch, and CEOs of um, uh, Michelin getting together at Clemson to talk about how can Clemson working with federal agencies help these companies thrive. Um, and when, when they came together, what they said was, uh, how can we do capacity building without replicating programs? Uh, because uh, virtual reality, e-learning, developing education programs and workforce initiatives are extremely expensive and we should not be competing to take existing resources, but how can we use those existing resources to build the workforce? Next slide. So we, we went about looking at corporate partnerships uh, as well as partnering with federal agencies. And the idea here was all those companies are partners in, on the education front. Um, they are not competing on the education front. Uh, they all are uh, helped if the enterprise, which is in our case, Clemson University and the Center for Workforce Development, partners well with federal agencies and funding agencies uh, and our technical college system. So we created a broad collaborative with our technical college system to add capacity through e-learning and virtual reality tools. Next slide. And part, as part of this initiative, we have created this, the Clemson University Center for Workforce Development, which partners uh, with our state agencies, which partners with Duke Energy, which why would Duke Energy uh, come to the table? is the biggest electric utility and a thriving advanced manufacturing industry uh, helps their bottom line. Uh, we partnered with states workforce development entities uh, to look at digital learning, career pathways, K-12 STEM education and advocacy uh, for 
advanced manufacturing workforce development. Next slide. And as part of this initiative, we came up with the, a platform called Educate Workforce. The Educate Workforce platform is built upon the edX platform. Uh, and as part of this platform, we have e-learning tools, virtual reality modules, um, CAD models, about 27 courses. The curriculum is used in 46 states um, by almost 14,000 users. Um, and the idea here is that this curriculum is available at a very nominal fee um, to our technical college partners. So what it does is it allows capacity building so that the technical college instructors can easily de deploy this curriculum, the e-learning tools and the VR modules, and it gets seamlessly integrated with whatever learning management system that they are using. Whether the institution is using Blackboard or using Canvas, Educate Workforce seamlessly integrates. At the same time, um, we are partners whereby we are not cannibalizing their revenues, but we are helping them uh, achieve their educational objectives. Next slide. And as part of this effort um, in e-learning, we develop a series of virtual reality simulations. Um, it takes a lot of effort um, from conceptualization to actually deployment, such that these virtual reality simulations can work off the simplest of platforms, that is inter-platform integration, operatability, as well as it should be working not just of your PCs, your Macs, but also every single digital platform that you can think of. And while doing so, uh, we were able to make sure that our technical college partners, subject matter experts, their voices were heard as we ensured that these tools at the end of the day, achieve the learning outcomes expected of the education curriculum. Uh, and to explain how we went about doing that uh, is my good colleague, Dr. Kapil Chalil Madhukar. Kapil. Thank you, Dean Gramopadi. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Great. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, in the next series sets of, set of slide, I'm, I'm going to talk more in terms of the process that we typically use to build these particular simulations. And I'm going to talk about three different simulations you know, that we have built you know, over the period of like uh, past 10 years as such, right? Um, so again, when we talk in terms of developing simulations, right, um, we should be focusing more in terms of having a systematic process to build these particular simulations as such. And there's quite a lot of things that we could learn uh, from software development, you know, when you're building these simulations as such. So typically, when we start with a simulation development, we do have a set of researchers, I believe a, we do have a learning scientist, we do have multiple subject matter experts, we do have a learning scientist, we do have a curriculum designer who all work together to build these simulations as such. And over here, you could see that we place a significant emphasis upon the boxes that are on orange. So over here, it starts by identifying the training needs um, uh, and where we conduct several interviews, focus groups and observational studies with the instructors, with the students, and with other stakeholders who are involved in that particular process, trying to identify what exactly are they trying to build or what exactly are they trying to uh, solve. And then based upon it, we will build a set of uh, educational objectives. And based on it, um, we will identify a few learning outcomes. And it is at this phase where we closely work with the learning scientists and curriculum designers to identify you know, what exactly should be the learning outcome for each and every simulation. And then comes the phase where we generate multiple simulation concepts as such, right? Because using virtual reality, you know, you could create, you know, whatever kinds of simulations that, that, uh, that you would like, but it's very important that you identify the kind of concepts that is going to support the learning outcomes and the educational objectives as such, right? So we generate quite a lot of simulation concepts um, and then we develop what we call storyboards that clearly articulates what are, what are the ways whereby a student would interact with these particular simulations? What are the things that they would see and things of that sort? 
Um, and then we will enter into this phase where we develop assessment instruments. And that's where we have the learning scientists, the instructional designers and other subject matter experts, the instructors and the students would closely work with the team to develop these assessment instruments as such. Uh, and then we test these particular concepts extensively um, uh, with, the, with the students and with the other set of stakeholders. And then we plan the downstream development as such, right? Um, and again, the, the, box, the, the boxes that are on blue, um, that basically talks about the software development process as such. And again, once you have the right kind of concepts that you need to build uh, for the virtual reality-based system, it should be a straightforward process as such. And one of the, one of the uh, issues that we have seen is that um, people uh, place a significant emphasis on the technology aspect about, about the system and placing very significant, uh, 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 um, very, um, very, uh, very less significance upon the initial set of steps that are required to complete the task as such. And so our recommendation would be to maybe just focus extensively on identifying, you know, what would, what, uh, what would be that particular concept that you're going to design, how you're going to design it, and then focus more in terms of the virtual reality or the technology development aspect as such, right? And the technology development and aspects involve 3D modeling, uh, we do UV mapping, texturing, and then we build the animation, and then we do have an iterative UI development phase as such. Um, and we test with the users during this particular time, and we will refine the different assessments that are being created by the team as such. And over here, 99% of all the simulations that we built are using a tool called Unity 3D and we integrate all these components with the Unity 3D platform. And uh, then you do have the quality assurance and we do have the dissemination piece as such. So when you talk about these virtual reality simulations, I believe, uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen completely immersive virtual reality simulations, you know, desktop simulations, there are multiple types of simulations that are available out there on multiple platforms as such. Um, but when you take a look at our use case or the set of users that are going to use this particular simulation, and um, most of them do have access to a laptop. So one of the constraints that we had when we were building these particular simulations was that uh, all these simulations need to run on a very normal computer that is connected to the internet as such. Because when you're talking about, you know, students at two-year colleges who are using this particular system or other students, and uh, they do have access to a normal computer and these simulations need to work on that kind of a system as such. So all the simulations that we have built uh, um, uh, are compatible you know, with a normal computer that could be connected to the internet. And most of the simulations are extensively used uh, on a browser where they could launch this particular simulation on a browser and would be able to experience those things as such. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So the first scenario that I would like to talk to you about is a simulation that we built for aviation maintenance technicians as such. Um, so in the aviation maintenance technician fee uh, 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 curricula, uh, there are a set of modules that are focusing more in terms of teaching a, uh, an aircraft maintenance technician on how to fabricate rigid and flexible fluid lines you know, for a aircraft maintenance as such. Um, and again, one of the challenges that were mentioned to us by the uh, subject matter experts in, in multiple two-year colleges was basically this, uh, 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 the, the, the set of instructions that the students need to receive when they are completing this particular task as such. Um, and we built a simulation and it approximately costed us $57,000 you know, to build this particular simulation. And the development time was approximately three months as such. So if you could take a look at the set of simulations that we have built over the past one past decade, you could see that the development time could range all the way from one month all the way to seven to eight months as such, right? And so again, the development time is going to be a function of the kind of things that you're going to design using virtual reality. And again, uh, the kind of um, uh, 3D modeling requirements that are associated with the system, the testing aspects associated with the system and things of that sort. Uh, but our team typically spend a lot of time uh, on the initial phases of the system design, you know, where we try to identify what exactly are the needs, you know, how can you build a particular concept, uh, how can you make sure that you're collecting feedback from all the key players before we move forward with building the entire simulation as such. Um, and the core team you know, for building this particular simulation involved an instructional designer, um, a learning scientist, and a visual designer or a UX researcher, and a virtual reality developer and multiple subject matter experts as such. Uh, so the instructional designer is going to take a look at the content and is going to give you feedback on how 
uh, you can maybe tailor this particular content to this audience as such. And the learning scientists typically conduct studies on the different kinds of concepts that we create, uh, and they tend to uh, provide recommendations on how we can improve certain visualizations and things of that sort. Um, and the visual designer and the UX researcher provides information on how you can design the UI in such a way that the students will be able to complete the task uh, 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 um, uh, in a friendly way. And then we do have the virtual reality developer um, who closely work with this particular team to incorporate the concepts that has been designed as a virtual reality simulation as such. Can you go to the next slide, please? Before you move on, Kapil, can, you, can I ask, uh, I really appreciate getting to see the development time, the team that it took to put this together and some cost data. Um, how, uh, how complex is the back end of this? Is this mostly procedural? And if so, can you do things wrong here and see what the uh, disastrous outcomes would be? That's a great question, Greg. Um, so I believe in all, almost all of the simulations, you know, we do have three different phases. You know, the first phase is primarily the phase where you uh, provide the basic terminology or nomenclature of the things you know, that the students need to know as such, right? And then you do have a guided practice phase where the simulation is going to talk about the steps that are required for a student to complete the task as such. And then comes the phase, Greg, that, uh, 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 that you mentioned where uh, students are given an open-ended task where they try to complete a particular task and they could make mistakes out there and the system is going to tell that I believe that the things are not being done in the right fashion as such. So absolutely, you know, we do have that particular capability incorporated. And that's one of the things that the SMEs always mention, right? Because students always tend to make mistakes you know, when, they're when they're trying to complete these things. So having a simulation uh, to enable students to walk through the entire set of steps you know, where they could potentially make mistakes would be very helpful as such. So to answer your question, yes, absolutely. You know, we have got the capability. Can we go to the next slide as such? And here we do have a video of, a, uh, yeah, uh, of the simulation that we created. Um, can we play the video, please? So this is basically the simulation that has been built, you know, that talks about the step-by-step -step, uh, uh, processes that are required for completing that particular task of building a fluid line and fitting. Um, and here you could see that there are terminologies involved with the system. And then uh, again, uh, the system is going to guide, you know, uh, the student on what or, or on the steps that they need to complete. And here you could see that you know, there are instructions that are provided at the lower end of the UI. Um, and the students can look into that particular UI and they can complete the task as such. Um, um, I believe uh, what they, they need to complete the task in the right fashion to move from step one to step two, right? And uh, so it's more in terms of a guided uh, practice phase where students are um, completing the task in a step-by-step -step fashion. And once they're done with this particular set of tasks, then, then they're given an open-ended problem that they need to uh, fabricate a fluid line and fitting, and they have got access to all these tools and they could experience those things in a virtual reality-based environment as such. Can we go to the next slide, please? And we'll make sure that we'll, uh, uh, we'll make these particular slides in the video available to you so that you can go through the entire set of uh, uh, videos and clearly understand the different ways whereby we have incorporated this, uh, um, uh, yeah, these features. And the second scenario that I want to talk to you about is basically a, a virtual reality simulation that was built for an automotive firm as such. Um, so uh, one of the automotive firms you know, reached out to us and mentioned that you know, they would like to have a virtual reality simulation or they would like to have an intervention where they could teach you know, their employees on the safety infortunes that are happening in a manufacturing plant. And right now, the way how this is being done is by using a set of PowerPoint slides. You now, where they walk through this set of slides and they tell them what are the issues associated with and things of that sort of such. Um, so the challenge that was given to us is that uh, whether we could identify an intervention whereby we could clearly tell them you now what is what is going on wrong in this kind of a um, an advanced manufacturing setting as such. So uh, in this particular scenario, we closely worked with an instructional designer, a visual designer, and a UX researcher, a virtual reality developer, and multiple subject matter experts, you know, both from academia as well as an industry, you know, to build 
uh, um, a virtual reality simulation to support some of their needs as such. Um, so the approximate uh, development time was, was six months and it costed us approximately $83,000 know, to build this particular simulation as such. Can you go to the next slide? Maybe I can explain more about the simulation um, when, you are, when you are watching the video. And can you play the video, please? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the use case was that I believe you do have quite a lot of safety violations that could potentially happen in an advanced manufacturing environment. And um, again, the way how it has been trained you know, in the current setting is by, by using a set of PowerPoint slide, slide decks as such you know, that are provided by OSHA, right? Um, um, and again, uh, in this virtual reality-based environment, what we did was basically, uh, we went back and took a look at uh, all the safety violations that has happened in the past. And we basically created a database of all these violations as such, right? Mm -hmm. And so st the trainees or the workers would typically go through the normal procedure of what, of, of attending the lectures and things of that sort that talks about safety violations. And then they are immersed into this game-based environment, right? And there are random things that are happening out there. And some of those things are just made for fun, like the electric hazard and things of that sort. Um, but there are random safety violations happening out there, including people not wearing the personal protective equipment. You know, there are oil spills and things of that sort that are incorporated in this environment. And the students basically assume the role of an auditor, right? And they do have a device in their hand uh, and they just walk, walk around the entire uh, manufacturing plant and tag the different violations as such. Um, so the interesting part about the simulation is that and the initial system architecture that was built, you know, uh, was designed in such a way that no two students will see the same set of violations, the same location as such, meaning these violations are generated at random, you know, when the simulation is running as such, right? Um, so you could see that there are quite a lot of things that we could incorporate over here. And we do have a database of some of the most commonly identified you know, safety hazards and things of that sort in this kind of an environment. And we have the ability to incorporate you know, all these violations inside this environment and having an architecture initially in place you know, really helped us uh, uh, um, to, build, uh, to build additional uh, scenarios into this environment as such. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the third one is uh, a scenario, uh, I guess, is a case study uh, on a, of, of a project that we worked with, uh, worked with uh, an insurance, insurance firm on, right? So, and so when you talk about the insurance companies as such, you know, they do have quite a lot of risk engineers, right? Or field, field engineers who basically go and look at buildings you know, before they underwrite the risk associated with the property as such, right? And so again, um, the challenge was that there are, uh, the, uh, I guess the company was looking at ways whereby they could train their, uh, new risk engineers or new field engineers on the potential things that they need to look into when they do the field inspection of, of buildings as such. And what they identified was that this is a skill you know, that takes a long time for people to um, learn. Um, and, and again, uh, many a times I believe the expert inspectors, meaning the people who have been doing this inspection for 10 to 20 years, you know, there are certain cues that they, 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 they look into when they're trying to understand you know, the potential risk associated with the building. And they, uh, they were looking at ways whereby you could provide this particular information to um, the trainees you know, who are new to this particular uh, uh, method as such, right? And so what we did was that basically we created a virtual reality simulation. And again, we followed the same set of steps that I showed in the earlier slides where you had um, um, I guess uh, multiple observational studies, interviews and focus groups you know, that were conducted with the expert risk engineers uh, to identify you know, what are the specific cues that they look into when they're looking at a building to, uh, to, to underwrite the risk, risk associated with that. And based upon that, we basically built an entire database of all the things that they, could, the, uh, that they would look you know, to, uh, uh, to understand potential risk with the building um, and then we followed a very similar kind of a format like the one that, that I showed earlier, where uh, there are multiple buildings that were created, you know, where all these defects could happen in a random fashion and students basically enter into this building in a virtual reality simulation, they walk around the building, they tag the different uh, issues with the building and a report will be generated just like the way, you know, how it happens in the real world. Um, and the instructor would be able to evaluate the thing, kind of things that they missed and, and the things that they need to work on as such. Um, and the approximate de uh, the development time was six months um, and the cost was approximately $80,000. Uh, 
Um, and the core team included an instructional designer, a visual designer and a UX researcher, a virtual reality developer, and multiple subject matter experts as such. Can you go to the next slide, please? And can you play the video? Thank you. While you're getting ready to play that video, I have a couple questions. Sure, Greg. Uh, how, um, how productive are these, these items? Uh, there's a company that had you develop the safety hazard. Uh, is, does it represent uh, efficiencies in their training program? Is it cost savings? What kind of, uh, what do we know about the benefits of, of doing, investing in these kind of simulations? Right, you know, that is a great question. And um, um, I guess uh, in our studies and both, both I believe, um, both, in, both in control experimental studies, as well as through um, anecdotal feedback that we have received from the trainers, um, they have really liked this particular simulation. They are in, actively using these kind of simulations primarily to support their trading. And the simulation for the, the I guess, for the risk engineers, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, it's been used globally, you know, primarily to train the global workforce, you know, on identifying the, uh, the potential risk associated with the building as such. And so there are companies that are increasingly incorporating these kind of technologies, uh, uh, primarily to support their training needs as such. Um, and again, our uh, control experimental studies that we have conducted here at Clemson do provide evidence that you know, this is going to really enhance their understanding of the kind of issues you know, that um, the, uh, uh, the worker would face in the real work environments as such. So there is evidence you now to support you know, some of the, the efficacy of some of these learning environments as such. Uh, but again, our initial hypothesis was that uh, this kind of virtual, re uh, virtual reality-based training is going to replace the hands-on training that was required for the workers as such. We conducted several studies as such, but we don't have enough evidence to say that this is going to be a complete replacement you know, of the hands-on activities that they would do. Uh, we would still recommend people to um, complete these hands-on activities in addition to the virtual reality-based interventions that we're gonna propose. Patrick, I think we can play the video while we're while we're talking. Uh, did I answer your question, Greg? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I hear I heard something about how this isn't a complete replacement, and to the extent that it begins to get in that direction, I can see that it would be uh, would save would save a lot of uh, trainer time, right? Yeah. And this could be done by the student as many times as they wanted. Anyway, you might want to narrate this. Oh, sure, Greg. So I guess if you could take a look at this particular simulation, the initially what the trainer would do is that the trainer and the students you know, would walk through the simulation together and the trainer would clearly tell the students so the kind of things that the trainer is looking into when they are evaluating this particular building as such, right? And um, so again, the, the way how, how, how it's being done in the real world is that they do have a digital camera. They just walk around, they take quite a lot of photos, take a lot of notes, and then they develop a report you know, that would go to the underwriter uh, uh, primarily to assess the risk as such, right? Um, so again, in the first phase, the instructor um, uh, walks the students through this particular simulation, talks about all the things you know, that, uh, uh, that they need to look into. Um, and the second phase would involve students basically wearing the particular role without having any, any assistance going into these different buildings, you know, where there are a lot of, I guess, cues that they could see. And based upon it, they can uh, take multiple photographs, you know, they can take a lot of notes, and then they build a report you know, on, uh, uh, um, um, uh, on the potential safety, uh, 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 the potential issues you know, uh, uh, that need to be considered when underwriting that particular property as such. And right now, uh, this particular simulation is used, you know, I guess, throughout the globe you know, for training the global workforce as such. Um, I believe when you take a look at these kind of systems, again, it takes a long time primarily to complete the interviews you know, with the set of stakeholders as such, but we had access to the subject matter experts you know, who have been doing these kind of activities for quite a long time. Uh, so we were able to conduct these interviews, we were able to identify the kind of things that they look into, um, and we, we reviewed quite a lot of their reports, um, and we created a database of all the things that they could look into and use that one as the basis to build this particular simulation as such. Um, and I believe the good thing that, did that, that worked well for us you know, from a lead time standpoint was that 
uh, we initially build that particular architecture that is going to help us you know, build this particular simulations as such. And all the other simulations that we created at a later phase basically use the similar architecture, making, uh, uh, making, the, uh, making uh, the development time significantly shorter uh, to build these particular simulations as such. And we will make this entire set of videos as well as the slides available to you. Um, and I guess I would uh, hand it over to my colleague, you know, at, uh, Eric, at this time. And if there are any other questions, you know, please do let me know on Q&A or if you want to maybe chat offline. Uh, my information is provided on the slides. Happy to take this conversation further. And again, thank you, Greg and Michael, for extending this opportunity to present. Uh, thank you, Kabul. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about a project uh, that's funded by ONR called the Virtual Manufacturing Lab. Next slide. Uh, and so as part of the Virtual Manufacturing Lab, we are creating a cross-university design house. So this is a partnership between MIT, Clemson University, and the University of Arizona, where we're creating content, digital content for manufacturing workforce education uh, specifically targeting the MUSA Institute. So we're, we're, we're uh, in, the, in the first year, we are targeting AIM Photonics, uh, which we have a lot of subject matter expertise on our team. We have a lot of integrated photonics experts on our team. And we're targeting uh, fiber manufacturing that, might, that would be useful for AFOA. And in uh, the coming year, starting this October, we're gonna be branching out to the other MUSA Institute. So we hope to make many more interactive digital uh, content and digital simulations and games for different institutes. And all of our digital content, we are being, we are hosting it on an OpenEdX platform, uh, a new OpenEdX platform that we're building that is specifically targeting the MUSA institutes as well as Educate Workforce, which couple mentioned. Uh, next slide. And so uh, we we really have three different categories of simulations that we're creating. So the first category are fundamental simulations. These are kind of micron scale, uh, in our case, since our field is integrated photonics, uh, optics uh, of, the, of the micron scale interactive simulations targeting uh, 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 components in, a, in, a, in an optical circuit. But you can imagine that these might be fundamental simulations around many different topics, something in chemistry, something in physics. Uh, so I can talk more about that if there are, more, if there are questions, but I'll focus on the final two. So uh, we are creating tool training VR simulations with, uh, with Koppel and his team. And we're also creating educational games with the MIT Education Arcade. Uh, next slide. So, uh, oop, one back. Uh, so, uh, couple's already given you an overview of how these procedural training sims are created. Uh, and so, we in our first year we created a procedural training sim around. Uh, uh, a MCVD lathe process for creating fiber preforms, and then an MC, and then a draw tower for drawing optical fiber. Uh, but in year two, what we're currently working on is we're building a fiber crafting game, where you'd have certain objectives, and you could also choose to tackle the objectives in different in different orders. We're creating a whole UI where you get to now adjust all the parameters of the lathe. You can increase the temperature, decrease the temperature. You can change the precursors that are flowing, change the flow rates. And our goal here is. As, uh, we feel like gaming is really useful whenever you have a very complex system. So our goal is to allow students to really explore these complex systems and, and create their own recipes for this for the fiber lathe that will allow them to create different optical fiber that uh, uh, that will have different properties that they can explore in our in our fundamental simulations. And so uh, one of the things that we're excited about in this case is that we're allowing player autonomy to be able to just uh, uh, choose their own objective that they're going to pursue. Maybe they want to make single mode fiber, a multi-mode fiber, a graded index fiber. They might have different tasks. Or they might just actually try to push the system. And as Greg was saying, a lot of times we're going to allow them to increase the temperature to a point where now you have issues where the, 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 the tube is collapsing too early and other, other types of failure states. Uh, so we're, I think the idea here is to really open up the space and have students learn about uh, the tool in a way that allows them to really understand the fundamentals of the tool. Next slide. Uh, and so here, I, I, since Couple's already given you a good overview of the desktop VR simulation design process, I wanted to explain a bit more about how we actually create an educational game. So uh, we go through a, quite a bit more user testing and iterative design. So uh, in, in, in our case, we, we would establish the educational objectives and do some initial research. 
it's important that the game designer know a little bit more about the field and kind of explore a lot of different aspects and uh, interview many subject matter experts. Then he goes through a phase of paper prototyping, and I'll show an example of this in a bit, uh, where we do user testing with note cards and, and on paper, so we can change the, the uh, different elements of the game rapidly. Uh, then we go through creating the design documents and then go through digital prototyping. And this is the case where we're actually going to test the game loop and test the game elements to make sure that it's working and engaging. Uh, and then after we've completed the design and done all the experiments that we needed, we go through the production phase where we, uh, is similar to what couple show, we, we, we use uh, Unity C Sharp. We uh, incorporate all of our backend models into, into the game. We uh, design the UI, we create the, the uh, digital, all the digital assets. And then we go through a final phase of user testing where we're now designing the levels if there are levels in the game. Uh, so you can see that this is a very iterative process and we end up really trying to make something that's engaging and exciting for the users. Uh, and so then in post-production, we now integrate all of this on OpenEdX with our videos that we've produced to introduce the game or, or uh, summarize what you learned the, during the game. Uh, and we also create assessment exercises and, and we have learning scientists who then go through and see if the educational objectives are met. Next slide. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly go over one game that is uh, being polished as we speak. So the game is, is close to release. Uh, and so uh, our game designer, Rick Eberhardt from the MIT Education Arcade, his group has uh, decades of experience uh, creating educational games for research purposes and also creating educational games uh, for commercial use. And so uh, he interviewed uh, subject matter experts from Columbia and from Facebook to create a, a game around hyperscale data centers. So the idea here is that you're the CTO of a, of a data center, and through the years, as different technologies come online, as, as different technologies are become available, you get to decide when and how to incorporate those technologies. Uh, so his, his idea was really to give them the ability to explore a large, complex, dynamic system where you can play through in different, with different strategies. Uh, next slide. So he uh, interviewed multiple subject matter experts. He looked at how data centers visualize what's going on inside of the data center. Uh, and he, he uh, took a lot of information in to try to create a UI that would be e uh, easy enough to, to see the most important elements that he wanted to, to show the students. Next slide. Uh, so here's an example of his paper prototyping. So you can see that he's using dice to simulate randomness in, this, in the paper prototype. He's created a, a, a grid where you might uh, install your servers, install your racks. Uh, and he created this kind of treadmill feature where certain jobs become available at certain times and you might have certain technologies that you could research uh, that maybe you're looking down the road. You can put money towards researching some technology uh, and then maybe you could create a, a, a higher performing optical switch. And if you uh, spend some money, you can get that technology ahead of time. But if you wait until it end, reaches the end of the ramp, then you'll be able to just incorporate it for free. Uh, and so he, he was really trying to allow students to have kind of two different methods where they can research better technology and time that correctly with the with with the, the jobs that they have or increase capacity so they can uh, actually fill out more racks on the, on the floor. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the next phase we went through digital prototyping and UI design so we created mockups of what this might look like to the to the users and uh, you can see that this is a very iterative process like uh, originally there was much more complexity and we brought that down to the, only the needed components. Next slide. Uh, and so I'll just show a video of the completed game. Uh, so if you can play the video that I, uh, it's, yeah, there. Excellent. So what you're seeing on your screen is uh, uh, a student going through and choosing jobs from the job list, looking at which uh, the, the floor space that they have, installing racks, uh, then looking at what, uh, what technologies they have available, what, 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 their, what, their, uh, what the switches look like. And so they can install more switches, install more cables, uh, and they can also edit which cables they're using. Uh, in this case, since you're just starting out the game, you only have one option available. But once you research more or, or find more uh, uh, options, you can then uh, upgrade these, these technologies. And every and and a lot of right now, what's going on behind the scenes uh, as as we speak is that our game designer is currently tweaking all these numbers to make it so that this is a very playable game. So that what he wants to do is really encourage students to be able to explore different uh, strategies that will work and maybe they can uh, like trying to uh, research technology earlier will 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 be have one solution one path towards a solution toward, towards a data center that's that's uh, earning profits or, or you might be able to 
uh, a build out capacity and just take the easy jobs. So uh, you can see that there's a lot of uh, many options that the, that the student has available to them. But importantly, what we're trying to build into this is that they might under, start to understand how optics ended up becoming useful in data centers. So one of the main learning goals we have for this sim, for this game, is that uh, they understand that as technology, as, as the uh, energy cost for an optical component becomes lower and lower, that means that you can start to incorporate optics further and further into your uh, data center. And the end result, once you get to the final levels, will be that you have integrated photonic circuit components and optical switches that become available. And you'll realize that because of that lower, because of that uh, lower energy cost to use an optical component, now you can use sh have shorter distances over which integrated photonics makes sense. Uh, so in, uh, the way that we envision using this game, a lot of the times will be sort of as an introduction to the field. So we might want to uh, kind of use it as a hook to bring people in so they then explore our other simulations and get more of a, in, uh, of a understanding of what we're trying to accomplish with integrated photonics. And we also have interviewed multiple community college instructors that said that they would love to use this uh, as a, a tool for getting like uh, nine through 12 students engaged and interested in this in becoming an optics technician or working in a data center. So uh, a lot of the times what we're trying to do is just give people a sense of what the application areas of our integrated photonics is. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so I, I think the, uh, to, uh, to so just looking at the costs that are associated with building this. So because, because we're iterating so much, we have our game designer working on uh, uh, the design for, mul for, for multiple weeks. So we, uh, the production uh, time is m roughly eight months per game for these web games. Uh, so we have them design, prototype, and, and do user testing for 12 weeks. Then we begin production for 15 weeks and a polish and develop deployment phase for five weeks. So it costs roughly 300K to have this, lar this larger team iteratively designing this product. Uh, but we are also uh, very much hoping to be uh, expanding this to other types of games. So there's, because there's, there's a very large number of types of games that you can use, you can have level-based games, you can have a game similar to the one I just showed you where you can play it multiple times. We, we really want to have students be able to uh, ex play the game uh, multiple times and learn different things each time they play. So they might, uh, you, they might play the first time and, uh, and, and kind of get a grasp of what, what one strategy uh, worked and then they can play a different time and use a different strategy and figure out exactly how companies will make decisions, how data centers will make decisions about incorporating new technologies. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you so much. Great. So um, I have a couple of questions, uh, Eric. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at this uh, game uh, about uh, server design. Mm -hmm. So why are we creating a game out of this? Is it um, considered to be a good instructional tool? Does it replace uh, developing real world um, installations and testing them? Exactly what's going on with this simulation? So we, we in th this project, we identified four application areas of integrated photonics. And what we are trying to do with this, with this game is really uh, use it as an engagement tool. So we, we are putting this, for instance, we're building a, a, uh, a sensor building game, for, for, which we're going to be putting in front of our sensors course. So students that, that, that uh, sign up for our integrated photonic sensors application course will play the game early on, get a sense for what, what, what the application of these sensors are. And then afterwards they go on to watch the videos in, their, in, our, in the course to, to work in. So, so in this case, somebody who is uh, maybe an undergraduate might be introduced to what the field and be encouraged to, take, to continue and take a course. And, and we are hoping that that will increase engagement in our online courses. Uh, so I, in, in some ways, what we're trying to do is really try to uh, attract uh, nine through 12 students atta attract undergrads to be interested in this field and to also maybe understand a bit of the, the fundamentals in the application areas of, of the technology. So it sounds like there's a lot of context and especially around the applications that the game is helping to provide um, as an engagement tool and to help to Facility, you know, uh, provides the motivation um, for the the course. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And and uh, we are planning online courses on the edX platform through MITx and through OpenEdX that are touching on all of these application areas. 
So what we're going to be doing is putting these courses in the very beginning of the course to increase engagement and get people excited about the technology. So what would be the difference between using the uh, simulation that you created and there was a paper prototyping where you had dice and such? Um, what's the additional advantage of creating the uh, computer-based simulation than uh, doing the game? Good question. Uh, it's mostly uh, reach. So you can easily provide a link to a web game that anyone can explore. Whereas a paper game, you have to print it <laughs> or you have to make it easy enough to download and print it yourself or, or something like yeah, I think it's also that we can hide a lot of complexities. For instance, for our uh, photonic sensors game, game number two that we're working on this for this summer, uh, a lot of the back end of what goes on would be just way too complicated to put into a paper game because then you'd have to perform all these calculations on your own. Yeah. It, digital games let you sweep a lot of the complexity under the rug. So the back end physics model or the back end uh, model of uh, like other players and other, and other AI doing different things, uh, you can just sweep that under the rug where they don't see it and it's not a complexity in the board game. Is that, is that represent any value loss in terms of the educational uh, value of it? If, if we thought there was something that was valuable there, we'd show it to the user. So I think that we, we, that gives us the, the flexibility to, in a lot, of, a lot of times, if you like, for instance, a simulation, if you, if you enter into a, the most expensive and state-of-the-art flight simulator, you might be, as a, as a novice user, you might be very overwhelmed. And there's so many controls and so many complexities that you just really don't know how to, but if you play with an RC airplane, let's say, with a remote control, like there's four knobs you're turning, it kind of focuses your attention on pitch and yaw and you can learn the principles of flight in that way. So we can really focus the player's attention and hone in on the specific learning objectives that we have. Very good. I wanna ask a question or maybe test some assumptions here and, and lead to a little bit, hopefully a little bit of discussion around um, other potential applications. Um, I didn't note the slide uh, but Eric, in, in your presentation um, at the beginning, you had a slide showing sort of the three categories of virtual engagements um, that we've heard about today, and and we sort of skipped over the fundamental si simulation a little bit. But um, <clears throat> the way that I, I'm I'm kind of going to just repeat my understanding of these and and start steer the conversation towards applications in. Um, you know, the advanced manufacturing technology. So I'm, I'm doing these in order. Um, the, the fundamental simulations that I think some of us have seen before, um, many at the micron scale, um, I could see applications there, you know, to understand the fundamentals of a manufacturing process, material science, advanced joining, microelectronics, how those function, um, how they integrate into advanced packaging, um, and and then things like biological processes. Those are sort of some applications that come to mind for that type of um, simulation. The, the next one is the tool-based, which I think you know, we, we saw some good demos um, from Capital um, and understand there's, there's a bunch of other applications there um, with a, a lot of applications in um, practical skills, uh, technician training, um, but engineering as well. Um, and then in the, the uh, the educational games are more focused on context setting um, and, you know, attracting people to the industry and, um, you know, feeding them in, creating on-ramps to these more in-depth technical courses, um, both to Eric and, and Koppel. Are those um, assumptions <laughs> reasonably correct? And, and I'm curious, um, you know, from our, our audience um, where, where you guys might see um, some applications for these educational approaches um, for, for your institute mission. I would add just one thing at the very end. I think the educational games are also useful for exploring complex systems. So procedural training, I think is really good where you, you're showing them, this is what you do step by step. But a lot of times, getting people to explore very complex systems, uh, like I guess the fiber lathe is a good example where uh, you want them to learn many, many things that you can include in your physics model in the back end, but uh, having them like, it's actually more useful for them to explore it on their own and to try to like, and try and fail to do things. <laughs> so I think that's why a couple and his team also create game-based approaches to things where complex dynamic systems are hard to get, make procedural 
like uh, uh, like training sequences for. Rick, um, that's a very good point. And Michael, to your point, um, I guess many a times you know, we get uh, worried only about the technology as such, right? So I have seen people who came to us and said, okay, we want an augmented reality-based technology. We want to incorporate AI into this technology. But then again, I would not worry much about the kind of technology that you're gonna, uh, you're gonna use. And again, it should be primarily driven by what exactly is the problem that you're trying to solve, right? At times, you know, you're trying to teach people how to complete a set of actions, you not know, set, 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 set of steps, you no, know, on a missionary as such. At times, the goal would be primarily to teach the students, um, okay, what is going to be the impact upon the final product when these parameters change? You know, um, uh, there could be a few process-based variables or a few, uh, few, I guess, few underlying mechanisms that you may probably want to educate the students. And again, that should primarily drive, you know, what kind of simulations are we going to develop? And again, when you talk about these games and all the other things, there could be a million different concepts that we could come up with, but mostly all of this concept is not going to translate to having the right kind of educational objectives as such. And that is where we have got techniques such as paper prototyping and iterative testing and all these things would come into play where you do have learning scientists, subject matter experts, uh, and, and, and as well as instruction designers you know, who all work together primarily to provide us with the right kind of feedback as such. So my one takeaway is that I believe let's not worry about the technology. You no, know, we can build things using technology, but let the underlying need you no know, drive the kind of simulations that we're going to develop. Uh, I, I agree completely with couple, and I'll add one final thing, which is that games are also used for identity forming. So if you're per, if the purpose that you have is I want people to think of themselves as operating within uh, some technology or within some context, like becoming a technician or becoming this person, uh, a lot of times when like that's a, like that's something that that. Uh, we 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 operate in all these three categories, but that's something that that you can use educational games to do. So uh, you can definitely have them think of themselves as that type of person when they're when they're using that when they're playing the game. It's another important tool and aspect of the engagement and, and attraction sort of mission. And, and couple, I really um, think your point about starting from you know the learning outcome objectives and understanding the complexity of the problem. Hopefully, um, I, I think today you guys have done a, a great job of demonstrating a lot of the technical approaches to address a, a series of different, um, you know, educational problems. Um, and and I think you know an, another common thread here is that it, it really seems to be a iterative process, starting from those fundamentals and building up, um, you know, concepts and paper prototypes before going into production on. Um, you know, a, a technology product uh, that has its own development um, pathway. Um, so that was fantastic. Thank you. Let, let me also add to what Eric and Kapil mentioned. Uh, the whole idea of using technology and VR or AR, uh, the return on investment is only when the system is complex, as they mentioned. Uh, it has multiple degrees of freedom. Um, and especially the gamification of it is you explore and you develop the relationships within different degrees of freedom, right? Um, so uh, if it's a very simplistic system, you, you don't need, you, you can use a simple procedural rule-based system. Um, when it is not, and when there are multiple degrees of freedom and the multiple rules, uh, and all of them cannot be laid out, uh, and Greg had mentioned about a paper prototype, uh, you won't be able to put uh, 10 factorial scenarios uh, in a paper prototype. Uh, but you can easily do that in a gamification or a VR environment. And, and what that lends itself to uh, is the classic personalized learning approach. I may need to use a lot more VR tools and understanding of the system, and I can catch up much faster offline, offline in a sense, on the VR system when I, than when I come back to classroom. So if done well, it could be a good equalizer for students who are lagging um, to, to come up to speed. And that also helps the instructor in the classroom because then they're not teaching to the lowest common denominator and holding the students who are ahead back. So, but Michael, you said it right. It's, there's a lot of work that has gone into this uh, development of these things. Uh, you can see a number of people, the mastery, the experts, uh, it's, um, we have companies coming and saying that, can you develop the VR for this? And I've said, 
can you train our people? And I said, no, uh, this, for this, you need to go to school, get a computer science degree. You need educational experts, psychologists. So uh, I think that is a message that I think both Eric and Kapil, I think hopefully have articulated well to the audience today. Picking up on that, just because I realize we're almost out of time. Um, if there's a handoff between uh, people that do your work, Eric, Kapil, Anand, and the subject matter experts that are uh, developing educational components uh, up to the point of developing the, the simulations, what is the, what is the handoff point and what, how much uh, sophistication and understanding simulations would be advisable for someone to efficiently work with a technical team to create a series of simulations, as perhaps the institutes may be doing. Kapil and Eric, you want to start first, and then not that not that I cannot answer that question, but uh, um, in terms of uh, we have involved, I, I'll come back. We have involved subject matter experts right from. Um, deciding what has to be learned through learning outcomes and through every stage of the process. Uh, the subject matter expert is almost like uh, if you have to build a house, the analogy is if you have to build a house and you have a contractor, but uh, you're going to be the owner, you are there throughout the every step of the process to make sure that the customer's voice is heard throughout the whole process. And the subject matter expert is making sure that uh, Contextually, we are right. The, though we are developing the VR models, the physics behind it is correct. Okay, uh, the, the, the realism is there. So the subject matter expert plays a very, very key role throughout the entire design process. So if you were to say handoffs, um, at every stage, we go back to the subject matter expert after each stage. Is this meeting the objectives? And solicit their feedback. Couple, you can, and Eric can speak more to that. Absolutely, Dean Brahmapati. And again, that's an excellent question, Greg, I believe. So we closely work with the SMEs, you know, um, as we go through the initial phases of conducting interviews, focus groups, observational studies, and then we enter into this phase where we identify the learning objectives. Um, and again, one of the phase where we have got extensive involvement from the SMEs is the concept generation and the concept identification phase. You now, where we come up with multiple concepts, you now we, we, we share these particular concepts with the SMEs, gather their initial thoughts. And again, they could provide you some insights on whether these concepts are going to be effective, but without conducting you know, testing you know, with the students or with the trainees, you know, we are not going to learn more. And so again, um, uh, we could maybe come up with around 10 to 15 different concepts, but not all these concepts could undergo maybe proto proto paper prototyping and such. Right? So we will identify some of the most promising concepts you know, from that list, and then we take it to the students and we conduct studies with them, and then we provide a recommendation as such. Uh, but I would say the initial part of our entire process flow, the boxes that were in orange, you know, we involve SMEs you know, uh, at different phases as such. And once they have okayed the final simulation, once the learning scientists have identified that these are the things that you want to move forward with, then alone it moves to the software development phase. You know? Prior to all those things, it's just prototypes and paper prototypes and again, digital prototypes that we play around with to make sure that you know, it achieves the right kind of learning outcomes as such. Eric, do you have anything else to add? Oh, just that it's also fun to be a subject matter expert on these projects. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, well, thank you all. Uh, this has been really fantastic. And I wanna thank, um, there's one other subject that I think was a, a good bonus. Um, some context that, that's useful here that um, Anand was able to provide about the Educate Workforce platform uh, and how that's, that's grown and has a really you know, great impact um, and driving partnerships between you know, Clemson and, and community colleges and, and industry. Um, Eric mentioned uh, the, the Open edX learning platform that we're uh, working with MIT to stand up um, for the Manufacturing USA Institutes and, and other partners. Um, and, you know, it's very young at this point, um, but hopefully with, with the Clemson Educate Workforce example um, and as a, a partner, you know, network um, can see the potential uh, that these platforms can have, especially when they're, um, when they're, they're loaded with these uh, fantastic, you know, both um, 
as you know, courses, as well as these interactive simulations to enrich those and move beyond uh, just knowledge and getting into skills and um, you know, deep conceptual learning. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, and I think we, we had a great program here today. I, I know I learned a lot. I hope um, that our audience did as well. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Greg to close this out. Yeah, I think we're gonna, gonna close. Just thanks to our presenters and thanks to our colleagues at RTI for uh, setting this up for us. We'll see you soon and we'll extend the conversation in some new directions. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.